Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have a fantastic topic with our friend Tanika Combs. She is with Got Advocacy, and she is a special education advocate. Um, I am Michelle Morris from Consolidated Planning Group, and I will go through a little bit of the uh, housekeeping items before we get started. Now, we're in webinar mode, so that means that we cannot hear you or see you participants, but I do see the number of how many of you are out there, and I really appreciate you spending your lunch time with us. Um, I know that you might be eating, enjoying your uh, lunch, your snacks, your beverages, um, so that's fine because we can't see you anyway, so no worries there. Um, if you have any questions or comments, we would really appreciate it if you would put those into the chat box. That way I can keep an eye on the chat and let Tanika know if, if we have any questions for her or I can answer any questions that you might have for me. Uh, we are also recording this webinar. We do that with all of our webinars and we post them on our YouTube channel. Um, it's really helpful and there's hundreds of different webinars over there. So if you're interested in seeing what we have presented in the past, if you've missed some of them, feel free to uh, go on over to our YouTube channel and I'll share the link a little bit later uh, to help you get there. So today we're going to be talking about developing a master plan to start the journey into adulthood. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about Consolidated Planning Group and who we are and why we do what we do and what is it that we do? <laughs> well, we are financial advisors. We live, we're located just outside of Houston, Texas in the Sugarland area. And, uh, you know, through the magic of the internet, we are able to work all throughout Texas. And we also serve families all across the United States. So no matter where you are, we can help you begin your planning for special needs. Now, because we're, uh, we are financial advisors, but we are also special needs planners. We help families with protection plans for their family. I'm talking about, you know, various kinds of life insurance or disability protection, income protection, things like that. So that when you're not here anymore, your loved ones will be able to carry on without you and continue paying the bills and not have so much to worry about while they're grieving. We do lifetime care plans. Some of the things we're going to be talking today, talking about today, like um, how to make sure your loved ones will be cared for once you're gone and how much that might cost and how to plan for those future um, needs. We do a lot of transition planning because so much changes when your child turns 18 and they become an adult. We're going to talk about a lot of that today, too. We help families with ABLE accounts, um, investments, securities, portfolios, all of those things. And really, we're here to educate and advocate uh, for you. The owner of our company has four kids all together, and two of them have special needs. And that's why we really step up to do what we do. There are over 263,000 financial planners in the United States, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And out of those 263,000, I want you to think in your head, especially if you've never seen our webinars before, how many of those you think focus on planning for special needs families? Okay, you've got that number in your head. Out of 263,000, 200, actually less than 200 financial planners uh, across the United States focus on special needs planning. That's less than a tenth of a percent. And I rounded up to 200 firms when I was looking at these numbers, just to make the math a little easier. <laughs> but yeah, you are definitely in the right place when you're talking to us at Consolidated Planning Group, because we understand the nuances of what you need to know for special needs planning. And a lot of times, if you don't have an expert on your side when it comes to these matters, especially when it comes to um, educational things like Tanika helps with, financial things and legal matters, you need experts who understand what it takes or else you could end up spending more money 
with us later to fix something that got messed up along the way. So today we're going to talk about developing a master plan to start that journey from childhood into adulthood. What does that look like? How does that work? Uh, Tanika is going to take over for a little while, and then I am going to come back and have more information for you from the financial side of the house. Uh, but Tanika, if you would like to go ahead and get going, perfect. Awesome. I can see your screen. Can you That's see my screen? Photo. Great, great. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, this is such an awesome opportunity because a lot of what I do in this approach, it definitely sets parents up to be ready to sit down with Consolidated and get the plan going. So um, just a little bit about me. Um, I founded God Advocacy in 2013. Um, I am also a parent. Uh, I currently have a 21, almost 22 year old on the spectrum. That's pretty awesome and amazing. Um, I'm a special education advocate. Uh, we are also providers through Texas Workforce to provide those community uh, vocational skills for uh, work experience, training, job development, all the education that they need in the coaching. Um, and I have an extensive background in transition support services, transitioning individuals from institutional care into the community with a lot of those waiver supports and things like that. Um, so with that background in case management, and I've been a federal disability integration advisor. So all of these things help me to prepare families to provide informed choices on how to plan for this journey that's called transition. And so through that, I have created an approach that's called the master plan. And basically, you are the CEO of your child's life. And so we plan accordingly. So we identify all the key elements that you would do if you were planning for a business, identifying what your vision, your vision and your mission statement. So the strategic plan, it's a clear, focused, concise and flexible plan that helps you get equipped on this journey towards transition. So it's the best way to take charge. And so through that approach, the um, developing a strategic plan helps you map out not just long term goals um, that you have for your child, but also short term goals that that require like critical thinking, implementing and developing certain action steps to deliver certain results. And so with that, we, you have your vision for, for your child and you identify those values and what you're providing is a tool. So this tool is a one page snapshot that you can take to any type of provider, whether you're in a, in a special education ARD meeting, if you're going to talk to service providers, it's a good snapshot of your child with your uh, family's values and perspective in place. Because throughout the years, we have a lot of assessments that tell us all of the, the, the missteps with our child and the things that they're not achieving, but we don't spend enough time highlighting on those things that make them great. And also, that shows areas that they need improvement and how to take the steps to get there. And so that's pretty much what the master plan creation is. So like I said, it's that clear, clear, clear map and no family's plan is the same because everybody has a different journey. We all have different values. Um, and this is, this was basically me being a me for me when I was going through the journey as a special education mom. And so I said, I am going to jump in the trenches, learn everything I can, get equipped in every way I can so that I can be that me for me for other parents. Um, so this strategic approach into transition. So like I said, you are the CEO. So do you have a vision for your child's future? What are the barriers that your child needs to overcome in order to get to the process that you need to, to get to? And so we map that out because a lot of families are not having conversations about the future right now because they're too busy doing the thing. They're doing the thing every day. They're going to therapy. They're, they're dealing with the school drama and all of the things that they don't have time to think about tomorrow because they're so consumed with today. And so this is a great way to strategize, to develop a plan that establishes action and accountability and um with an advocate in mind. And so what it is, is it's equipping parents to advocate for their child effectively. 
And so, and basically the strategies, it's a roadmap. And so if you're going on a road trip, you have that map, you, you know which way to turn left, which way to turn right. So what we do is in order to generate some of those results, we align the desires, the strategies, they align with the visions that you have for your child, the values that you have for your child. What are some of their strengths and weaknesses? Like what are some of those things that like might make your child tick that people need to know in planning for what's the next end goal? And so strategies just help you make a decision, solve problems, and over, overcome obstacles. And so it's really mapped out so that you have a great guide on your journey. And so in that, we identify what that vision is. And that vision statement is where you visualize um, the picture that describes your child's future. And so, you know, we write those vision statements in positive terms because we get so much negative connotation when we're looking at, like I said, all the paperwork that the school offers for our kiddos that they don't even know what your true vision is for your child. Sometimes we have our meetings and we get in a transition plan and they may ask you some questions and they skip over so much. And it's the most important part of your child's journey when you're going through special education and developing a transition plan. I meet families all the time. They've gone through those meetings and they're like, was that a transition plan? I'm like, I think that was if they documented it on your paperwork. And so it's very important that parents have already thought about these things before they get up, get to the table and they say, hey, so what is little Johnny going to do when he gets out of school? And if you haven't put all of the pieces together to talk about what kind of supports do you need to get there? What are the strategies? It's kind of hard to make those decisions in. Um, in those type of meetings, because they're, you know, a lot of times they're intimidating meetings if you don't know the language that they're having in some of those art meetings, if you have kids in special education or even receiving services from um, other long term care supports in our in our community. So so just like in, in, in business, you have your vision, your mission statement. So that mission statement, it reflects that emotional commitment and passion that you have on why you're advocating for your child. Before, and so never mind. I was gonna say before you go on, could you give us some examples of the differences? Oh, here it is. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Good job. So, Thank you yes, for reading so, my mind. <laughs> exactly. I like I said, I made this me. I'm a me for me, so I think that way too. So <laughs> so a goal without a plan is just a wish. So there's a lot of times I hear people say, Oh, I wish my child can do this. Oh, I wish. And I'm like, Well, have you ever thought about what it would take to do that? So you start by thinking like, what kind of things do you want your, your child to be able to do? How do you want others to consider them? Like, what are some of your values, some of the beliefs that you have um, with your families, with your family? And what are, what, are the, what are your goals and ambitions for your child? And what type of person do you want them to, do you, what do you want to see them become? And so you map this stuff out. There's a lot of objectives that go into play because, you know, a lot of people want my child to be president of the United States. Well, that might be a little far-fetched. And sometimes I sit down and I, I, have, um, I have sessions with some of my clients and, you know, they have very far-reaching, you know, like they would say, um, I want to go to the WNBA or I want to play, you know, with Michael Jordan and, all of the greats. And I'm like, well, we got to start somewhere. So it's mapping those things out. So what we're doing is we're trying to keep it in positive, keep it positive and focus on what you want your child to achieve, not what you don't want them to do. Because a lot of times when you start describing your child, a lot of times I hear families talk about all the things that they can't do. And so we have to reverse and see what are those strengths? How do we build on them? to build and make strategies to help us achieve certain goals. And so you're writing a vision statement. It's just an important part of setting them up for the future. And so I, I love quotes and everything. So it says, be brave enough to live the life of your dreams according to your vision and purpose instead of expectation and opinions of others. There's a lot of times where we have people put expectations and limitations on individuals that have any level of disabilities without knowing what the greatness that they have and how they can be such a great asset to, um, to, to everything that they do. So, 
So in doing that, you know, we take a moment and we reflect on what is that vision that I have? Like, what does that look like? And so we sit down and we map that out. And so an example for your vision could be uh, for my child to be loved, cared for, and appreciated with the level of independence within the maximum extent of their ability. That's what you visualize, like that long-term thing. And, and this is pretty much a universal statement because a lot of families, they want their child to be free from any kind of abuse, neglect, exploitation, and all of those things, but to live out the, their, their life dreams and the the most extent of their uh, independence as possible. And so um, with goals, there's always expectations. And so when we write our goals, it kind of makes you stretch a little bit. They give you direction um, and they keep you focused when you lose perspective. So you write them as outcomes. It's so interesting because I sit in a lot of our meetings a lot of times with school districts and the way that they write a lot of goals for our individuals, they don't have specific outcomes. And I'm like, we, we need to be able to measure these things. And so we miss that a lot in, in, in the school system. So it's very important that we establish our own set of goals. And these and what's what I like about this plan is it's not just, you know, you have your IEPs that you have those plans that we use in the school. They change every year. And this plan can be a plan that is ever changing or it can be a long-term goal. It depends on what your expectations are as far as how you set your goals. Like, what do you want your child to learn this year? What do you want them to achieve next year? Um, and what do you expect your child to know as they move to the next level of academics? Um, and what do you need to know? And what do you need to be prepared for when the school bus stops coming to your home? A lot of times this gives a lot of overwhelm and a lot of emotions um, with families. And it's a little bit much to do at one time to think about and to, and to just swallow. So, um, and school don't, schools don't make long-term plans for your child's future. That's your goal. That's your job. They're, they're going to hand you some brochures and pamphlets to get with agencies and all of that stuff that can help you with that. But that's not the role that they pretty much take. So, when you take a moment to reflect on that, it's what does the future hold? Um, and when and when you think about those things, like do you envision your child getting additional, um, going to post-secondary education or getting some vocational training? Um, what does your child need to be to be prepared for any level of independent living, further in education or employment? These are areas that when I sit down and talk to families in sessions, they haven't thought about because they're still trying to get through elementary school, high school, middle school. This is a lot to consume, which there's a lot of things that we should be doing in your middle school periods, in your junior, in your middle school, junior high, high school. There's a lot of things that have to start um, taking um, into consideration when you're planning for this. And so this is why it's very important that you have a plan like this because it helps you plan for the future. So as you go through it, and like I said, this is definitely you putting your vision for your child's futures into words. Like imagine your child as an adult. Um, what, is that, what does that world look like for them? Um, what do they need to learn to get there? And so a lot of times this is, this is a grieving process because a lot of times families that have individuals with any level of disability, they have their wishes and their could'ves and their should'ves and but you have to stop and take a, a look back and say, you know, what does the world look like when they're operating in the capacity of their fullest potential? And that is what this plan is designed to do. We're taking all of these nuggets and putting it into a plan that you can sit down with any, anybody that services your child or, or, or you're planning for, whether it's school services, post-secondary, vocational training, it's just a good visual of what your child is and who your child, you know, what their ex what your expectations. So when we think about that, we take a moment to reflect because there's a lot of perception and then we have beliefs and then we, we add our fears to that. Um, and a lot of us have a lot of fears. And if you are a natural human being, if you are a child, with, if you're a parent and your child has any level of disability, you have fears. And our fears are always probably the same, that our kids be free from neglect, 
abuse and exploitation. But there's a lot of protection that goes into that. But what does that look like? Um, and so I like this quote from Leonardo da Vinci. It says, all of our knowledge has its origin in our perception. And so if we allow others to put a lot of perceptions and values and beliefs on the outcomes that our individuals should have without our input, input it invalidates who they are, what these strategies look like. And so a lot of those perceptions are mostly based on outside stimuli. So these are just kind of exercises to get you really thinking. And then we always talk about um, developing smart objectives and you know, goals always need to be accurate, measurable, achievable, time-based and relevant. Like I said, if you have an, a, you can have such a small goal. It, and this plan is for everybody. It's not for, oh, my child's in high school. Your child could be transitioning from ABA care into elementary school or getting into school for the first time. And there's things that they need to know. It could be potty training. It could be tying their shoe. Just the most basic things. You can put an objective and a goal in place for that. And it's really important that you start thinking about those things. What do I want my child to achieve this year, next year, in the next three years? So these goals really kind of stretch you and make you think a little bit. And so, and also in business, we do what we call a SWOT analysis, where we identify what the strengths and the weaknesses are, and we identify the opportunities and threats. So when you analyze your child's strengths and weaknesses, you uncover how well your child is operating in the current school setting or with its current resources. And so when you identify opportunities and threats, you analyze your child's threat, you uncover how your child is affected by external factors that may be out of your control. It could be lack of resources. It could be um, not having the right supports in place in their current setting. And so when you think about it, this is really a snapshot of what makes my child great. And if you think about like strengths, hardworking, thoughtful, they are very organized. They might be art. They might be artists. They might have. Um, they might be strong. They can lift heavy things. They have a great smile. And in my world, I look at things like this, and I start thinking about occupations, long term things that they can do, jobs that they thought they could possibly have. So all of these things are very important when you are um, planning for your child and knowing what those opportunities are. Has great ideas. Happy to work with plans ahead, likes to show off their skills. Um, and some of those weaknesses might be in, impulsive, indecisive, impatient, gets bored quickly, um, shows a little attention to one task at a time. And so those threats are that it takes a long time to start a, start a task, rushes and puts time over quality, and loves enthusiasm, oh, loses enthusiasm over tasks. So when you think about this, like you probably say, oh, my child has maybe like four or five of these qualities or characteristics. But these are realistic things that help you to, to develop strategies for long term. And so it's really good because we don't sit down and map these, these things out. We look about we look at a lot of their present levels when we're in the school system. And, it, and a lot of times it's a lot. And so when you start thinking about that SWOT analysis, that can be used for children of any age, right? Any age. Or anybody actually can. And not even with a disability. Right. But, uh, you know, somebody asked in the chat box, what about if my child is getting ready to go from like the 18 plus program at school into adulthood? How can perfect. they use these tools? So this is perfect. So what I actually I use this tool for um, individuals when I'm doing um, job placement training with them, when I'm helping them to develop a job, because all of these attributes, we're helping to build their resume. We're putting, we're helping them to identify these things when they're getting ready to fill out an application for a job. Like they still need these tools. They still need to identify some of these things. So if you have somebody that's very um, organized, organized and they are they're very strong um, and they like to pour, put things in order and things like that. Like we start looking at jobs, like maybe working at a food pantry where they can even start volunteering to getting some exposure to any type of work. And that may lead into another, work, uh, like a paid work program. So it's very important. This is a very 
strong tool that I use when I'm working with individuals in the vocational rehabilitation. So any individual that's in that 18 plus program, this is very important. This snapshot right here is a real good tool because when you get to um, talking to your Texas workforce counselors to talk about those 18 plus services, just like in school, we sit and we do an IEP. They do what we call an IPE, which is an individualized plan of employment. And in that plan, we identify some of the skills that they have. What are some soft skills that they have? What are some of their weaknesses that areas that they need improvement on? So these, these items can be listed to develop a plan. Definitely for 18 plus. And so when you're thinking about that, there's also those critical factors. So the critical factors um, are the positive influences help your child achieve the specific outcomes you want them to achieve. So we start thinking about like the level of academic achievement, that social emotional piece, access to resources. We start thinking about environmental. These are critical things that if you understood and identify how they influence the effect on positive or negative, the outcomes of your child, it really would help like level of academic achievement. If you're making plans for post-secondary or should my child go through vocational training with an 18 plus program, when they graduate, should they graduate and be looking at going into a post-secondary school like Bath or HCC or a, another college program or do we need some more vocational development and we can get those things from like, you know, Texas workforce through their VR services. And so this is very important that you identify these things instead of saying, I want my kid to go to college. And you have to make sure that you checked off all of the boxes to make sure is that the right setting right now or do we need some more training before we get there? And so, you know, having that, thinking about those critical factors are very important. And with, Beyond anything else, it's promoting and encouraging self-advocacy. So these are um, helping them to decide when to speak up, um, what to speak up about, and knowing um, which people can offer support to your individuals. And self-advocacy starts with them believing in themselves, um, believing in any God-given abilities and having the courage and the strength to advise others and what they believe to help their dreams come true. And this is actually a, a snapshot of my son because he is a kid. He is the picture of self-advocacy because he pushes doors down and he, if he, he can want outrageous things, but he's going to keep asking about them and for them and how he can, you know, it, it will fit into his plan. So, so in, in, in all else, stay positive. Those self-advocacy skills can be learned at any age. It doesn't have to be you know, when they're ready for transition and everybody thinks transition starts, us, our kids are always in transition. We're either transitioning from one stage to another phase, another era, another school. We're always in transition. We don't ever stop transitioning. So always having that plan for what that looks like, moving, moving to the next, moving to the next. So, and so with that strategic plan, you got all the tools, you know, we help identify those things and we put them into a one page snapshot. And this is a great tool that you can take places. You can put a cover letter on the front of it that has a picture of your child and present this as a portfolio when you go in meetings so they know who your child is. A lot of times we have meetings for um, special education for our meetings. And a lot of times our kids are not in those meetings and you are having conversations with people about your child and there's no face to your child. And so what I love about this plan is I, we add a cover page to it that has your child's picture and then one page snapshot of all the things we just talked about. What are your values, your visions, your strengths, your weaknesses? What are some of the barriers, some of the current threats that you have? What supports are needed? What are the current support services that they're, that they're um, currently receiving? and any relevant resources that can help support them on this plan, because we also help develop what we call a circle of support, which in business we call a mastermind group. And that's when we start sending those referrals out because they need to go and have conversations with, you know, individuals as consolidated planning group to make sure that they're able to get to the next step with the financial planning. So we've just identified a lot of things 
and help them break down their thoughts and put it into a plan. And there's execution that has to go after this. And so there's also an action plan that's attached to it. Like when, like we got goals for our kids. We have deadlines. You need a deadline. We need we parents need that the deadlines too, because otherwise they're like, oh, I'm gonna get to that. And then their their child is like 25 and they're like, well, we we didn't do this, we didn't do that. Well, it's never too late to get started. However, this is a great tool that keeps you accountable. Um, it keeps you on target for your task and you know, helping you to achieve those things. Um, so that's what I have. I am Tanika Combs with God Advocacy. Um, I love getting parents prepared for transition. It's like, it's my jam. I love to advocate in the schools, but this is the funnest part of what I do because we really dive in, roll up our sleeves. We get, we get into the weeds of things and figure some things out. So that is wonderful. Thank you so much. When I was looking at that page that you had, you said the one, um, one page summary kind of of all of their strengths and weaknesses and goals. And it made me think that, you know, that would be great as, you know, including that with your letter of intent. If anybody here has been to our letter of intent webinars, you know, we talk about a lot of those things and putting them in writing so that if somebody needs to step into your shoes to take care of your family, that they have that information in a place where they can access it. And that would be a really great um, thing to include with that. Absolutely. Now, Tanika, um, this QR code, is that going to just download your information? Take you um, so this QR code is if you had other questions on how this you can, you know, I'm always available to, um, you can book a call with me, we can chat. Um, and then here's all the ways you can find me. I have email, website. Um, this is my phone number, my social media handle. So there's all things that advocacy code. This QR code is linked to um, if you'd like to see how we could, if you need any other sub additional support on how this plan can help you. And and one last thing before I um, switch gears for us here a little bit, I would and you can leave this up so people can make sure that they have time to contact get your contact info. Um, how do you feel about including the children in this and the other family members in this planning? I know that there might be some things like the parents' fears um, that maybe they want to keep to themselves and not share with their children uh, because you don't want to put your own fears into their hearts. But other than that, I mean, do you advocate for this being a family project? Absolutely. So um, when I first, I meet with my families, I do, especially if they're able to communicate their needs, it's important that their voice is heard if, in, in any mode of how they can communicate. So sitting down with families is, um, so I actually do this in like a workshop setting where we do this for four hours because we dive into each, when people walk away, they actually have a full plan. Um, and so in, in a workshop, they've brought their kids in there and we go through the exercises with their individuals. And it's so much fun. It's so much fun when we do that because they're, they're like, we're giving you ownership to advocate for yourself. And advocating for yourself, we have to teach you how to speak about the things, but informative things like what's really important, because one of the other areas is I do a lot of disability disclosure training with individuals. And a lot of them, they don't know what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are. So if we need to go somewhere and ask for an accommodation, they have no idea because we they've never done an exercise like this before. And so it's one of those exercises that I do do with um, individuals that are looking to what is the next step for them it helps them because you can't go on the job site and know and not know what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are we can explore some things while we're there but we also have to be able to identify some of those things up front and so um and so this is also like I do this in a workshop setting and then this is also a service that I offer individuals in it's sometimes it's too much in one session, they're like, you just, you you had me when the bus stops coming, what am I going to do? Then they're emotional. And so mm -hmm. it's like, we do this over four sessions of planning. And in that time period, if they want to include other individuals that's part of their circle of support, we can have strategies and we can really powwow with, because the most important thing is having that tool 
as a takeaway. You sit down in meetings and provide people with that. It is a very, very good description. It's accurate. It's clear on what your agenda is. It's clear on what your expectations. And that letter of intent, it's really important because think about it. Think about those families that started the plan and didn't finish the process with you all and something happens and you don't have anything like this. Yeah. And someone's got to step in and deal with, you know, some of the day-to-day stuff that you've dealt with and they don't know your child. And it's scary. It's so important, even, you know, little things that are big things in your family that other people might not get. Like the fact that, you know, your daughter, maybe she can get dressed by herself and you say, oh yeah, she can dress herself. But you forget to tell people that you have to help her pick out what to wear or else she's going to be wearing flip-flops when it's 30 degrees outside. Absolutely. You know, things like that. Uh, other people need to know. Now, um, you said that you do this kind of in a workshop setting. When is your next workshop? So my next workshop is March the 16th. Um, so I, um, God Advocacy is located in the Woodlands, Spring Woodlands area. We're north of Houston, off of 45. Um, and so my workshop is going to be at my office. It's going to be um, March the 16th from 12 to 2. And I provide, we provide lunch and we provide, the, they, there's another work, there's a workbook that goes with this that they take away with. So they actually have a workbook and they, they're able to complete their one page plan. So it's really like a four hour, like dive in and get everything established. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing all of that with us. Uh, just to round out today's webinar, I have several slides um, talking from our perspective about this, you know, how to plan for the future and how to get the ball rolling. We feel that, you know, it's really, really important that you take into consideration your own child's needs and you have realistic expectations for them. Um, understand those challenges and strengths. Let go of the notion that you have to follow this one particular path because that's the path that most people take. It's not the case at all. You can have a non-traditional path. You don't have to have a child who gets their driver's license right when they turn 16. You don't have to have a child who goes straight from high school into a four-year college program or longer at a college. You can have um, trade schools. You can have certificate programs. The Texas Workforce Com Commission and their VR programs are fantastic. There are registered apprenticeships. Um, maybe your child wants to try college with one or two courses at a time. You know, they can live at home or they can live on campus. There are even uh, groups that can provide support on campus for your student if that's something that you see as one of their goals. But don't compare your child and your family to everyone else because nobody's child is like everybody else. I, you know, people sometimes talk about if the flower isn't blooming where it is, blah, blah, blah. I don't like that one. I like to think of my favorite snack, which is popcorn. I make my popcorn on the stovetop because that's how my grandpa showed me. And, you know, you put all of the kernels into the same oil. They're heated at the same temperature at the same time. But we all know that as those kernels of corn are popping, they're never all just going to pop all at the same time. There are some that come up early. There are a lot that come up in the middle. And there are some stragglers that pop later or don't even pop at all. And that's okay. We don't blame the popcorn. We don't get mad at it. It just is what it is. And that's more how I think of, um, how I, I think of things is they're all going to pop or not. And if they don't, it's not a big deal. We're just going to deal with what we have. Um, when you're looking at finding a good fit for the future, you know, of course you want to look at different schools and colleges and programs that, that those schools have. 
Um, think about extracurricular activities that your child might enjoy. What clubs can they, they join to get out there and meet people and make friends? Um, maybe it's a book club or a sport or a musical group or a chess club. Who knows what those things might be, but whatever your child enjoys, you know, finding a good fit for them. When you think about their career path, you know, what do they enjoy? What are they looking for? And the work setting that goes along with that career path, does that match up? Because if you have a child where um, one of their strengths is that they can sit in silence and get the work done as long as they are not, um, they don't have a lot of external noise. Maybe that's one of their weaknesses is that they can't work with a lot of external noise and a lot going on and distractions. They need to find a work setting that will help fit those strengths and weaknesses. Um, so if they have a career path in mind where maybe they want to be a veterinarian and you think about a vet's office, there's puppies coming in, there's kittens, there's noise, there's barking. It's a great goal to become a veterinarian or work in the office with one. But if they're in a situation where they can't work, if they're too distracted, maybe that not, might not be a good fit or a factory situation or whatever, or vice versa. If they're the kind of person who just can't sit still and get a job done without you know, wanting to get up and talk to people and do other things, then maybe they should not be in a job like a banking position where they have to sit at a computer or in a cubicle and input numbers. That might not be right for them. So try to find career paths and work settings that fit the uh, SWOT analysis that Tanika was talking about. And, and, and to add to that, I think what's really important too, when you talk about those things and your, your child might still be in high school, but there are some pre-employment transition services programs that you can get access to while they're still in school to do some work experience training, to see like we, we, we could do some trial stuff. So getting with your um, Texas workforce, your vocational counselor to see what kind of opportunities are out there it gives you an opportunity to explore some things before they just dive in. So I, I, I really think that's a great, great option. Yes, absolutely. Now, um, accommodations, there are accommodations that can be made in school, as we pretty much know. Um, and there are also accommodations in the workplace. And there are accommodations that can be made for college courses, AP exams, SAT, ACT exams, if you want your children to take those. Now, typically, if they're going to go to a community college, they don't need the SAT and ACT. But if they want to go to a school where that's required, you can check with those testing um, companies and check with the schools and, you know, wherever you might want your child to have an accommodation or feel that they need it. Um, check those requirements and be prepared. They might want to know what accommodations you need and why. They might even request testing. Um, so if you haven't had any testing done within the past like three to five years, you might consider going back to the, the doctor's office or, or whatever uh, to get some updated testing. But they can give you accommodations if you need them, even on those, those big important tests. Uh, you might need a FERPA if you would like your college to talk to you at all about your student. You know, when they become adults, all of a sudden parents are kind of cut out of the loop sometimes. So a FERPA is a form that will help your college, your student's college, um, or wherever they are, release information to you. They can talk to you about grades and attendance and financial things. Um, but without that, they are very hesitant and usually will not talk to parents at all. Another thing that is important for college students, whether they are, you know, neurotypical or not, you might want to get a power of attorney and a healthcare power of attorney for your kids when they're not kids anymore, they're baby adults <laughs> and they go off to college. You know, my, my son went to Chicago for school. 
and he does not have any sort of intellectual or developmental disability, but he's in Chicago and I'm here in Houston. And what happens if he gets hit by an L train? Um, they would take him to the, the hospital and I would never know unless his roommates somehow found my phone number in his cell phone and finally called me. So it's important that we have the power of attorneys signed. And, you know, I always nag at him to have my information with him or on his refrigerator in his um, apartment with his roommates. Um, but yeah, it's important. Also, when is asking if um, Gloria is asking, will guardianship be okay? Guardianship uh, typically should be enough to cover you for these things. Um, but if you have guardianship over your child, you know, I mean, you just want to make sure you want to double check with the school. Each school might have its own policy, especially on that FERPA um, releasing information. It's very much like HIPAA rules with at the doctor's office. They're, you know, very limited on what they are allowed to tell parents and what they want to tell parents. So it's easier just to sign their forms and get it over with if you want them to share the information with you. Uh, once they go into the workforce, there are accommodations available as long as it doesn't pose undue hardship to the business that they're working for. For example, yes, of course, they can put in guard rails or uh, a ramp or something like that that um, could help somebody. But you can't make your business, make a business move their location entirely because it's easier for your child. That would be an undue hardship. But if you have questions about that, you can go to the Department of Labor website and or the Job Accommodation Network. And both of these will be clickable links when you receive these slides later on today with a link to the recording. You'll all get that in your email. I see we have some questions about guardianship, so I'm going to address those. This is just a list of some of the educational options beyond high school. So you can look kind of through this list while I answer this question. Isn't guardianship expensive and doesn't that take some rights away from them? So we've done webinars strictly about guardianship. You can find those on our YouTube channel. There are alternatives to guardianship or you could have full guardianship. Now, what that does is it, it does take away rights from your child. They will basically, under the eyes of the law, be children for the rest of their lives, and you will forever be their guardian unless, you know, the court decides that you don't need that anymore. Um, they will be as minors legally until this guardianship is lifted. So what does that mean? As a minor, you cannot vote can't drive, you cannot choose to get married, you cannot decide where you want to live, there are a lot of rights that are taken away. Uh, but for some families, it's important and, and that is what they want and that is what they need. Now, guardianship has to be done through an attorney. This is a court legal process. You have to go to court. Your child has to be served documents by the sheriff's office. They come to the house they serve your child documents, um, and it, it's a big deal. And yes, having the legal help to get that all done can be quite expensive because not only do you as the guardian need an attorney, the child needs an ad litem attorney who watches out for their needs. And of course, that has to be paid for as well. Um, the filing paperwork, the court fees, all of that stuff it can really add up. And it's very, very important that you find an attorney who understands, like I said before, the nuances of special needs cases, not just any old attorney will do. Um, okay, so back to, back to talking about post-secondary uh, education. If your child is considering college and going away to college, Bloom Consulting offers a campus connections program where they hook children up with mentors who um, can provide either in-person or virtual support. They do a planning process where um, they give your child a support team with a connections coach 
Uh, they can provide mentoring, guidance, navigational support, help with those problem solving skills and self-advocacy. Um, and this is a program that it, it is a little expensive. You know, it's about $1,000 a month private pay. Sometimes your VR counselor will be able to talk to you about sponsorship of this kind of a program. If, you know, going to college is in their plan, is in your, your yeah. child's plan. Um, now, we don't work for Bloom Consulting. They don't work for us. It's just an option. They're um, an amazing agency. Yeah. Have yeah. you uh, had luck with referring students to Bloom? Well, my son was at Bloom for a little while. Okay. In their other program. Great. Yeah. Camps too, as well as the colleges. Fantastic. So, so yeah, their contact info is there and you can reach out to them. Um, in the broader sense of looking at all special needs planning, again, it's very important to put together your team of experts. A special needs planning advisor like me, we focus on the financial side of things and the benefits for your child, you know, making sure they have their state and federal benefits. What does their cost of care for the future look like? Um, how are you going to be able to afford that and your retirement and everything else that you have going on? We look at the financial side of things. A special needs attorney will help you look at the legal side of things like that guardianship, uh, your wills, um, a special needs trust, things like that. You have to build your team of experts. When you're thinking about special needs planning, you need to gather the documents for what you've already done. You know, when you put your, when you're looking at a map or you're using your GPS, you have to put in the address where you're starting off. That's what this is like. Gather your documents so we can see where your starting point is. So we can tell you how to get from there to where you want to be. Uh, without that starting point and understanding where you're currently sitting, we can't really advise you on much. Um, some people, you know, we do offer always a free consultation and there's a questionnaire that we ask for you to fill out before your free consultation. Um, and sometimes people are hesitant to give us that information, but if we don't know where you currently are and we don't have that information before we start talking to you, we're walking in blind. We don't know how to prepare for our meeting with you. And we don't know what advice to give you to get you from where you are to where you want to be. So it's important that you um, give us some information so that we can help you the best that we can. The letter of intent, of course, we've talked about that a little bit already today, having that set up. Um, I used to be an English teacher, so I always say, Start that letter of intent on your computer. Start with the facts because those are easy for you to think of. And the facts will lead into the, um, the more subjective things that you want to talk about related to your child. You can work on that for several weeks, print out the version, then go back and edit, print out the latest version. As your family grows and your child evolves, you just go back and keep editing that document printing the latest, most up-to-date version and keeping that maybe in a binder or someplace where someone can find it, not locked behind two or three passwords on your computer. And then again, as we've talked about throughout today's entire webinar, thinking about your vision for the future. What does that look like for you and for your family? You also want to think about, you know, how much do you need in your child's special needs trust so that their future will be provided for? Um, how can you maximize your social security benefits? Not just SSI and Medicare and Medicaid and SSDI for your child, but your own benefits. If you turn those on at various timings, you get various amounts and we can help you maximize that amount. It's not always just waiting until you're 70 years old. Um, and it's it's a very interesting software that we have that can show you when and why to turn on your social security retirement benefits to get the most benefit for your family. And you want to think about what is going to happen to your child when you're gone. What residential communities are good for your child? What family members are good for your child? Um, and how that will look. 
We want you to make sure that you don't jeopardize any of those benefits from the state programs and the other, you know, federal federally funded programs. You will need to establish a special needs trust so that your money can go into the special needs trust for the benefit of your child. You never, ever want to have your child listed straight up as a beneficiary for anything, life insurance, investments, um, even your bank account. You want it all, if you want it to go to your child, to go to their trust. Um, and they could also have an ABLE account. You can have both, a special needs trust and an ABLE account. Those are the two places where your child can have money where it will not count against their um, eligibility for those benefits provided by the state and the federal government. This year, you can put $18,000 into an ABLE account. Again, we have full webinars just about that if you have questions. But really, the ABLE account is very similar to a 529 college savings fund. That's a 529C. This is a 529A for ABLE. The ABLE account is for anything that helps your child achieve a better life experience. Um, the beneficiary owns the account, but again, it does not count against their benefits. The account does earn income and that income is not taxed. So it does have that tax favorability. Unfortunately, you cannot deduct your contributions to the ABLE account, um, not federally. Some states will allow you to make a deduction for your state income taxes, but Texas doesn't even have state income taxes. So of course they can't give you a deduction here. There are special limits on the contributions you can make, but again, anything that can be construed as achieving a better life experience for your child, you can use the ABLE account for. Now the special needs trust, it does have rules on what you can use it for. You should not use your special needs trust for rent, utilities, food, cash. Um, if you do use your special needs trust for those categories of items, you will be receiving a one-third reduction to the SSI benefits that your child deserves. That's why you should have both the special needs trust <clears throat> for large amounts of money that you aren't going to spend on those four categories, food, uh, rent, utilities, and cash. And then you have the ABLE account for smaller amounts of money, but you can use that on anything. And yes, you can transfer money from the trust to the ABLE account as needed. Guardianship, you can begin that process when you are within six months of your child's 18th birthday. And these two things, the special needs trust and the guardianship process, again, it does require an attorney who focuses on special needs topics. This is a quick listing and I know I'm running low on time. So if you have any last questions, now's the time to get those into the chat box while I finish up. Um, this is just a listing of some of the local and Texas-based uh, transition and residential programs you might wanna check out. Again, all those links should work. If they don't, please let me know so I can fix it. We do have a link right here to all of our upcoming webinars so that you can register for them ahead of time. If you can attend, great. If you can't attend, you will still receive the information afterwards. This is just a list of some of the things that we help families with and talk to families about. Our group is small but mighty. We work as a collaborative team on all of our clients. Um, the four on top are the four financial advisors. Allison and Jeff, as I mentioned, have two special needs kids. And there's my, my glam shot and my husband's picture. We have two kids as well. And then uh, our team of operations staff who help with all the phone calls and paperwork and reaching out to family families. Um, so looking at all of these smiling faces, we will be reaching out to you because you registered for this webinar and we want to make sure that you're covered. Do you want a free consultation? That's why we're going to call you and what we're going to ask you. A polite no thank you would be great if you're not interested. If you are interested, this is a completely free confidential consultation for you. You can ask any questions that you want up front so that you get your questions answered. And then we'll talk to you a little bit about 
our advice for you, um, get to know your family a little bit more and tell you about what we do and see if it would be a good idea for us to move forward. We do offer some free services and some paid services, and you'll find out about all of those options on this Zoom call. It usually takes between 30 to 45 minutes, depending on how much information you're looking for. Uh, the links for all of our social medias are down there. There's the YouTube channel, Instagram, our podcast, in case you prefer to listen to these instead of watching them, and our Facebook page. So I see that we have just one or two more questions in the chat box before we go today. Um, if you get SSI, can you put money of theirs into the ABLE account? So yes. Children cannot have more than $2,000 in their name in a bank account. So when they start getting SSI at about age 18, typically, they're going to start getting $943 a month. And if they don't spend it all, you can see how that bank account can grow up past $2,000 within a matter of months. So the ABLE account is great to have because you can take money from the bank account and just scooch it on over to the ABLE account and be able to save money for your child in that account. There are maintenance fees, um, but we can help you set that up if that's something that you're interested in. We can answer your questions about the ABLE account and SSI and how that all works. If a child is on DAC, Disabled Adult Childhood Benefits, uh, though that's sometimes called SSDI, it's sometimes called DAC, and lately they've been calling it just um, Childhood Disability Benefits, CDB. Um, then can the special needs trust be used for food and housing and all of that? Yes, if you're not relying on SSI benefits anymore, then you can use the special needs trust for those things. It's just that it affects the SSI benefits. <laughs> She's happy to see that information. Great. All right. Well, that's all I have for you today. Um, just one more thing. We are looking as a company for pictures, um, testimonials. If you have something nice to say about these webinar presentations, if you've worked with us, if you've been through the initial consultation, if you have anything nice to say, we would love to hear it. You can email that to us. We love pictures that you would allow for us to use on our uh, website or marketing or anything like that of your loved ones. It's so much better to have real people than just stock images. Although, you know, we love that little girl with the paint on her hands. We use her on all of our brochures, but we're starting to find that everybody uses her because she's so cute and she's a stock image. So we would love photos of real people if you're interested in um, sending those over. We would love that. Anyway, have a great rest of your week. It's almost Friday. We've almost made it to the weekend. Please reach out to either Consolidated Planning Group or Tanika Combs if you her gotadvocacy.org. Um, if you have any questions for either one of us, we are happy to meet with you and discuss any issues or any questions you might have. Have a fantastic day. Thank you for taking the time to be here and for sticking with us through the meeting. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, Tanika. Have a great Bye. day. Bye. I'm sending the email right now with the slide, so. Right, great. And we will make sure everybody gets that. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.